Mr. President, I want to thank the uh, Senator from North Dakota for uh, allowing me to go first. I'll be relatively uh, brief. I've uh, spoken on the floor on a number of occasions regarding the my frustration uh, about the uh, Senate not spending enough time debating what I think is the key essential inter uh, uh, issue and the challenge facing us, uh, probably it's as greater than any other challenge facing this body in, in a long, long time. Uh, my frustration only grew yesterday as we uh, voted down four budget proposals. You know, it's been 757 days since we have passed a budget in this body. And uh, so far, no budget has been proposed uh, this year out of the Budget Committee for us to examine and to look at. Now, the President offered up a budget earlier this year uh, that would have spent more, uh, tax more. Um, it was voted down last night in what I think probably was a historic vote. I didn't go back and check the records, but I'm not aware of any budget that's ever been presented by the executive branch to the Congress for approval that has not received at least some votes. Uh, the vote last evening was 97 to 0 against the President's budget. Now, it's, it, it's almost unthinkable uh, that um, an executive, a, a President, the executive branch would send a budget to the floor uh, to be debated and voted on and not achieve one vote. I think what it tells us is obviously that budget was not designed to gain any kind of uh, bipartisan support, obviously, but it didn't even obtain any partisan support. Uh, so I, it was not taken seriously at a time when we need to have in front of us a serious budget to debate and vote on. As I said, 757 days without a budget before us. There's, you cannot run a company, you cannot run a family, you can't run anything unless you know how much money is going to come in or approximate that and how you're going to budget against it so that you don't continue to go into hock and into debt. But that's the place where we, where we were and are today. Now, uh, Republicans did come forward with three proposals. Um, unfortunately, all of those were voted down also. Uh, you can argue that... Uh, um, none of those three w was sufficient to, to garner some, some support. Uh, all three received a significant level of support, particularly two of them, and yet not enough to pass this body. And so while the House has passed a budget and put before us, um, a budget which we did vote on yesterday but unfortunately fell short, uh, these are the only proposals which we've had in front of us in order to debate and vote on and set the structure for how we're going to spend the taxpayers' money. So here we are now, uh, approaching the month of June, five months uh, into the um, current calendar year, and nine months into the fiscal year, and we still don't have a handle on how we're going to spend the taxpayers' money, what restrictions and restraints we're going to put on that, and how we might be able to go about and live within our means. This is the debate of this Congress that should be undertaken and has not been undertaken. Many of us have come to the floor in situations like this where we've asked for some time to speak, but the, the issue itself has not been put before us. Now, we know there are negotiations going on relative to how we put a plan in place that will help us get to the point where we can be, gain credibility in terms of our fiscal situation, but we're a long way we're a long way from that. So I'm standing here once again to try to urge my colleagues to uh, work together uh, to try to achieve a result uh, or at least a product on which we can have serious debate and determine the, uh, the future of how we're going to spend the money that the taxpayers provide for us and do it in a responsible way. Uh, the most important factor that we have to address is the need in my opinion, is the need uh, to rein in Washington's ex excessive spending. The bottom line is government spending is out of control. 
The public understands this. And I think the response in 2010 to all of those of us that were running and all the elections across the country sent an unmistakable, long, loud, easily understood signal. We have too much government that, that we... We can't afford the government that we have, and we're adding too much government that continues to push us deeper and deeper into debt. Nearly $1.4 trillion of our spending requires us to borrow money so that we have that money and that it puts us in a debt obligation, and clearly we need to rein in our spending. Now, part of all of this is, is, is discretionary spending, but it's only a fraction of what we have. Um, it is something that we should debate. It's something that is part of the responsibility of, of the United States Congress and the Senate. But we're talking now about addressing a deficit of over $14 trillion, and we need to get serious over a little nick here and a little nick there and a little spending reduction there and look at the larger picture. We're staring uh, down $14.3 trillion in debt. Credit ratings like Standard & Poor um, have downgraded the outlook for the United States uh, debt um, with a negative warning. Economic growth is uh, sputtering across the country. Unemployment remains high and states are dipping deeper in the red. Zeroing in on billions, which is a lot of money, but it's only a minuscule amount of money compared to the trillions that we ought to be, that we were saddled with in debt and that we ought to be addressing. So it's time for Congress and this administration to stop the obvious, stop ignoring the obvious. The rapid growth of mandatory spending is endangering our financial future. I point to this chart here on my left. Um, it simply points out the growth, the dramatic growth that has occurred and will continue to occur over the years in the future. And it doesn't take a mathematician, although the math is pretty simple, when you spend uh, $3.7 trillion a year and take in $2.2 trillion, uh, that leaves you in a big debt hole. But it doesn't take a mathematician or anybody with any sophistication in economics to understand that if we continue on the path that we're going, we are going to continue to see this line escalate. This red here is red ink. It's net interest that we will owe. What does that mean? That means that to continue borrowing in order to finance what we're doing, we're going to have to pay larger and larger rates of interest to the lenders uh, because of the risk associated with our potential inability to pay back the loans that we have taken. And this flow of red ink, this red tide here, is if we don't address this, it's going to make it difficult for Americans to buy cars, to pay their mortgages, to buy homes, to buy groceries. Uh, Every, the prices of, of products will go higher because the interest rates that we're paying are higher. We're just running ourselves into a, a desperate situation. I think everyone understands that. I, I think it's been clear to the American, made clear to the American people. Um, we don't have to spin this uh, whole message here in order to convince the American people that we don't have a problem. Uh, we do have a problem. They understand that. Uh, that's what 2010 was all about, and, they, and we continue to go forward now here in 2011 without providing any basis of a real solution to assure the financial world and assure people that we're taking steps in order to, to uh, address this. Uh, I've got a bunch of statistics here, uh, Mr. President, but look, um, if we, I think there is a, a consensus, and if anybody doesn't understand this, they haven't really looked at the problem. There is a consensus that we could tax Americans to death. We can cut discretionary spending in massive amounts, and we won't begin to address the problem that we have unless we address and put in place the massive amount of spending that has to go to the mandatory programs. Those things that we don't have control over in terms of budgeting they simply are there, and if you're eligible, you get to draw from the program. 
Now, all of that is fine if you've got money to do it, but we're running out of money to pay those who recipients who are continuing to receive benefits from these entitlement programs. And unless we address those, we are not going to solve the problem. Let's just take a couple of those, and let's, let's just look at Medicare. Everybody says this is, this is a politically, political non-starter. Um, if you dare talk about it or go there, um, you're going to get zinged in the next election. Uh, that uh, it can be characterized as, as uh, taking away benefits uh, from the elderly when the plans that have been put forward do nothing of, uh, of the sort. Nevertheless, it's important to understand that the, the dimensions of the problem that we're facing just from this one entitlement alone. Over the next 10 years, Medicare, sp Medicare spending, just for this entitlement, this one entitlement, not Social Security, not Medicaid, Medicare alone, alone is expected to double during the next 10 years. Just a few weeks ago, the Medicare trustees announced that the hospital trust fund would be exhausted by 2024, five years earlier than estimated in last year's report. Who knows what next year's report is going to tell us? Bottom line is this program is going to go broke. So failing to restructure Medicare jeopardizes the medical benefits of future elder, of, of Americans, elderly Americans, and future elderly Americans. And so rather than terminating Medicare, Medicare as has been charged, which is not true, rather than destroying Medicare, which has been charged but is not true, what we're trying to do is find a way to restructure it in a way that Medicare will be viable. It will stay sol uh, solvent. Benefits will be there for future retirees. When Medicare was first enacted in 1967, the program cost $2.5 billion. At that time, Congress predicted that the program would cost $12 billion in 1990. That wasn't the case. We underestimated, the Congress underestimated just a bit. Uh, by $86 billion, uh, which is more than just a bit. When you project that it's going to be $2.5 billion, when it starts at $2.5 billion, and you project that it's going to be $12 billion, and you end up at 86, you have to start asking yourself some questions. Ooh, maybe we got these, this formula wrong. Uh, maybe our assumptions didn't turn out just exactly as we thought they were going to do. Today, Medicare is roughly $494 billion, with approximately $89.3 trillion in total unfunded liabilities. These are staggering numbers. They're numbers beyond our ability to comprehend. Having said that, they're beyond our ability to deal with. There's just no possible way on earth, no matter how fast and how hard we grow, that we can possibly reach solvency in the Medicare program in the future. Why is that? Because after World War II, the soldiers came home, people had deferred having families, uh, the so-called baby boom generation was born. And it has moved through our entire history over the last 60 years or so, um, like a pig moves through a python. Early on, there was a rush to uh, provide housing for uh, soldiers and their families. There was a, uh, a, a massive infusion of money into baby cribs and uh, the need for uh, uh, hospitals and doctors and nurses that would deliver children. And a few years later, all of a sudden, we had to start building a massive number of new elementary schools as this baby boom has moved through their lifespan. We have seen dramatic impacts on the economy. Many of them positive, uh, but uh, the, the colleges that had to be expanded and built and universities and training facilities, the education that had to be provided, uh, the employment that needed to be provided, all of this has had a dramatic impact on our economy. We have known for decades that eventually this pig moving through the python was going to reach the point of retirement. And when it reached the point of retirement, it was going to have an enormous impact on our finances. But instead of anticipating this coming and putting in place structural plans that would accommodate the needs, the legitimate needs of those for, on, that, for retirement income and benefits, we have instead ignored 
this, this reality. We have pushed it down the road. Nobody wanted to touch it. De election after election after election, it was said, we better postpone that for the next election because it's just too hot to deal with now. Well, uh, it's all coming undone. Uh, we're at the point almost of, of no return. And so the proposals that have been put forward, you may not agree with every portion of it. I don't agree with every portion of these proposals. But the House brought to us a budget plan that was, you have to give uh, uh, Paul Ryan a great deal of credit for the extraordinary amount of effort and work he put into it. Maybe you don't like all of it. But at least it's a plan to debate, modify, adjust, but, but it's something that gives us an opportunity to start down the path of paying off our debt, of maintaining uh, sol uh, solvency for the Medicare program and other entitlement programs. And that's what we ought to be debating instead of simply saying, we're into another new cycle of gotcha. You've, you've touched the third rail. You've made the decision to uh, put Medicare in play and we're gonna take it to the public and tell them you're gonna take away their health care benefits when they retire. It's just the opposite is true. We're trying to save those health care benefits for those who are retiring. We're trying to look at ways that we can structure the program so it doesn't not only break Medicare, uh, but break uh, our entire uh, economy. Today, the average person is living into their 70s, and the average woman is living into their 80s and even 90s. And as a result, more elderly Americans are in Medicare than originally anticipated. Federal government can no longer continue with business as usual. It's time for some honesty with the American people. Washington is promising to deliver benefits it can't afford. We can no longer nickel and dime doctors and hospitals and force them to pay for the care Washington has promised elderly Americans. More and more doctors are having to turn away Medicare patients. The American Medical Association revealed that 17% of more than 9,000 doctors surveyed are forced to limit the number of Medicare patients they accept. And among primary care physicians, this rate is 31%. Why? Because we can't reimburse, we don't have the money to reimburse them for the cost that it takes to provide that care. The American Osteopathic Association said that 15% of its members refuse Medicare and 19% declined to accept new Medicare patients. Physicians and hospitals in my home state of Indiana are feeling the pain from the Congress inaction as well. Hospitals like Deaconess Clinic in Evansville, Indiana, say one-third of their patients are on Medicare. When doctors or hospitals are not receiving the necessary compensation for services conducted on one-third of its patients, it has a devastating impact on their businesses. If we don't reform Medicare, we lose Medicare. Let me repeat that. If we don't take steps to reform Medicare, we lose Medicare. If we don't restructure the program, more patients will lose the care that they desperately need. Mr. President, um, a very prominent figure, a leader of this country, made this statement. Almost all of the long-term deficit and debt that we face relates to the exploding costs of Medicare and Medicaid. Almost all of it, he said. That is the single biggest driver of our federal debt. And if we don't get control over that, we can't get control over our federal budget. That defines, in a very basic statement, exactly the challenge that's before us. It tells us, it gives us the it gives us the warning that we need to heed, and it should spur us into action. Let me repeat that. Almost all of the long-term deficit and debt that we face relates to the exploding costs of Medicare and Medicaid. Almost all of it. That is the single biggest driver of our federal debt. And if we don't get control over that, we can't get control over our federal budget. That is a statement made by President Barack Obama. It's not made by a Republican. It's not made by an editorial piece in the Wall Street Journal. It's not made by a Tea Party uh, leader or advocate. It's not made by any Republican. It is made by our current president. Our president has said, we cannot sustain what we're doing and we have to get at it or it's gonna take down our whole budget. Why in the world, having said that, 
and I think it's true, it's been backed by analysts that have looked at this whole situation, left, right, non-political, political, whatever. Why are we here not going forward with addressing this very question? That's what the people sent us here to do in 2010. That's what they're asking us to do now. And yet we're acting as if this statement by the President of the United States has nothing to do with what we need to do. That we can simply ignore this and go forward and just little, cut a little here and cut a little there, but we can't touch the entitlement. We can't touch Medicare. Oh, papers are full today of headlines saying you know, the New York Congressional Special Congressional Race. That was because the people have been scared into, I mean, I didn't say scared, that's because the people said, don't cut our Medicare. What it should have said is, those people who are saying don't cut our Medicare are basically saying, uh, keep mine going until this thing runs out. Um, I'm not sure I can, you know, I, I'm afraid I might live long, too long and then I won't have benefits at the end. But sure, for sure our kids won't have it, for sure our grandchildren won't have it, because at its current rate, as the President of the United States has acknowledged, it's unsustainable. So we have two options here. We can continue with the status quo. We can quibble over how much to cut from our discretionary spending, that which we have control of, and continue ignoring the entitlement programs, or we can make a commitment and have the political will to fulfill that commitment by saving those programs through some sound restructuring. This does not mean that current recipients of Medicare are going to be kneecapped or have their benefits dropped. This does not mean even those nearing retirement are going to face that prospect. What it does mean is that if we don't put reforms, the structural reforms in now to address the future problems, then we're gonna lose the whole program. The greatest threat to Medicare is doing nothing. If we do nothing, not only will Medicare collapse, but so will our fiscal house. Mr. President, a former president, another Democrat, Bill Clinton said, and it's in the papers today, he urging his fellow Democrats to, quote, don't tippy-toe around on Medicare. And I continue that quote. He said the program is part of a whole health care system that has a toxic effect on inflation. He went on to say, we've got to deal with these things. Mr. President, I'm here not to criticize the Democrats for putting us in this situation. I think we all bear some responsibility. The country does not want us to point fingers at each other. They don't want us to, to, to use this as a political advantage for the 2012 election. They want us to do the right thing that they all know needs to be done. And I believe they'll reward us and recognize us for at least having the courage to step forward and address a real problem that everyone now, I think, understands and recognizes. So whether it's the Paul Ryan plan coming out of the House, whether it's a, a Democrat budget plan coming out of the Budget Committee, whether it's some other plan coming out between the negotiations that are going on, or should go on, between the executive branch and the congressional branch, this is something that we have got to do. We have just simply got to put aside our partisanship and concerns and worry about the 2012 elections and simply say we have to rise above politics as we did in 1983 when we restructured Social Security. A Republican president, a Democrat House leader, members of the, of the Democrat committee, or congressional committee and, the, and Senate committee, uh, the political people stood together and said, this rises above the election. It's too important not to address, to transcend it. Can we just take this one issue and say, let's take this out of politics. Let's stand together as Republicans and Democrats and uh, along with the president and do what's right for the country. Now, the bottom line is, no matter what we do here, if the president doesn't support us in this effort, it's not going to succeed. He has the veto pen, and he has the ability to lead or not lead. So I guess, I'm call as I have before, I'm calling on the president to basically say this important issue can only be successful, Mr. President, if you will engage and you will lead us and you will be part of this effort to solve a problem that affects every living American and those to be born. 
and participate in this country. It dramatically affects our future much sooner, than I believe, than any of us think. It affects our economy and our ability to grow. All of this has to be coupled with growth policies. We can't cut our way out of all this. We can help restructure. We can help make cuts where necessary, and we can help our economy to grow by putting policies in place that will stimulate the economy. That combination, put together in a package, is what we need to support. And I'm just hoping that we will put politics aside for this one issue, which is so important to the future of our country. Mr. President, um, I probably said more than I need to say at this particular point in time. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. I again thank the Senator from North Dakota. Uh, for uh, agreeing to let me uh, go forward here. As chairman of the Budget Committee, I mean, I know he's uh, fully cognizant and aware of, of these issues and is working to try to address them also. I just uh, hope that we can continue to work together to find a solution to this very, very urgent problem. With that, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from North Dakota. I want to thank.